Uh, welcome to the uh, Tactile uh, Venus and Lymphatic Journal Club. Uh, thank everybody for joining us tonight. And we have some great papers that we're going to be discussing tonight uh, with my co-speakers uh, here, Dr. Tom O'Donnell and uh, Dr. Steve Dean. The first paper Tom is going to uh, talk to us about is on chronic edema. So the first couple of papers are out of UK, uh, and then we have one US paper. Uh, and like I said, uh, Tom is going to be discussing on chronic edema and the prevalent healthcare problem in the UK. Then Steve is going to touch on uh, the St. George classification paper and the algorithm of uh, primary lymphatic anomalies. And uh, finally, I will be discussing an interesting paper on patient reported outcomes after treatment of superficial venous disease. So um, at this point, Tom, uh, why don't you go ahead and share your screen so we can get started. While he does that, I uh, just want to mention to everybody, please, uh, if you have any questions during this, um, feel free to put them in the QA box and uh, we'll address them as the uh, discussion goes on. Uh, sorry. Hmm. Thank you. A little technical problem. No problem. So my uh, discussion this evening, I thought we'd focus on what is the prevalence of edema. And it's interesting that uh, they've expanded the definition in this paper to chronic edema, and I'll define it in a moment, as opposed to what we usually see uh, defined as lymphedema. And chronic edema is the presence uh, for greater than three months of swelling of uh, either the lower or upper extremity. And this uh, paper comes from Christine Moffat, Vaughn Keeley, Peter Franks, all three uh, well-recognized individuals who do work in the area of lymph lymphedema. Just to give you uh, a perspective geographically, this is a map of uh, the UK. I actually spent a, a year here in London back in 1975 studying with John Kenmuth and the area that they did the study in was called Dar Darby, but most people in the UK, uh, in the United States, would see it D E R B Y and call it Derby. Um, to give you a little background about Derby, it's got a population of about 250,000, which is comparable to Norfolk, Virginia, Scottsdale, Arizona, or Buffalo, New York. And uh, over 63 uh, percent, as far as <clears throat> races, are white. Uh, about seven percent black. <clears throat> this is much less as uh, than in the United States and Hispanic, uh, almost a quarter. So that gives you some of the racial background. And I hope Dr. Dean comments later on his own series looking at uh, lymphedema and the racial ethnic background. Now, as I stated, chronic edema is used in the place of lymphedema. So they've expanded the definition and it encompasses all forms of edema that persists for three months, irrespective of the etiology. And you can see why it's CO rather than CE because of the British habit of spelling edema this way and etiology this way. This is a cross-sectional study. That is, they estimate the point prevalence of chronic edema within the health services of one British urban population. In addition, they determine the proportion with concurrent leg ulceration. Now, when we look at disease frequency from an epidemiologic point of view, as you well know, there are two definitions. Prevalence measures the existing cases of disease and is expect, expressed as a proportion. By contrast, incidence measures new cases of disease and is expressed in person time units. What we're gonna focus on today is point prevalence, which is the number of cases here, chronic edema, 
and a defined population at one point in time. And the uh, figure is derived over the number of persons in a defined population at that same point of time. And that gives you the burden of disease. There are three functional definitions of prevalence, point prevalence, which we're looking at in this case, where the proportion of the population has a disease at a specific point in time, one year period prevalence, the proportion of the population that has the disease at some time during a year, and contact prevalence, the proportion of the population with at least one encounter with a healthcare professional for a disease during a year. This last definition is important because when we try and do prevalence estimates from looking it up, shall we say, in insurance uh, files, large insurance files, you have to see a physician to get recognized. And so that fits more into the contact prevalence and it would underestimate obviously the prevalence of the disease in the general population vis-a-vis -vis point prevalence. When we look at epidemiologic study designs, they are either descriptive or analytical and either under the descriptive uh, category, they either study individual case report case series, the great case series that Dr. Dean presented from his experience, or populations where you go in and look at a cross-sectional sample. Now, what happened in this particular study was patients with chronic edema in any anatomic site were ascertained by healthcare professionals. They looked at these populations in one acute and one community hospital as well as all relevant outpatient and community nursing services, general practices, and all nursing residential homes in the catchment area of Derby City. They also described the presence and distribution of chronic edema, which was confirmed through a brief clinical examination. And then they ascertained a battery of demographic and clinical details for each subject. Now, how do they determine whether a patient had chronic edema? Well, they used an observational test, the pitting edema test, where your thumb is placed into the site of swelling for 10 seconds. And if it's positive, a pit remains following the removal of the pressure. Well, those of you sophisticated in lymphedema or edema world, would recognize, well, that works fine if there's not extensive fibrosis because uh, in that manner, it wouldn't be pitting. And this is just a photograph of the test where a finger is placed into the tibial region and you'll notice the presence of a depression indicating chronic edema. Now, the demographics of this population were that 971 patients were studied with chronic edema of three months duration. As expected, like most chronic diseases, the age was in the Medicare generation, nearly 69 years. The total crude prevalence was 3.93 per 1,000 population. And it differed for men versus women. It, prevalence was lower in the men, 2.48 versus women, 5.37. And then, like as, a, as I said earlier, any chronic disease, the prevalence uh, goes up as one ages, such that in those greater than 85 years, uh, the prevalence was 28.75 uh, per 1,000 versus 10.3 in the younger generation, six to me at least young, 65 to 74. Tom, the, yeah. uh, the age I get, the gender, why double? Why is it double? Yeah, why is the prevalence so much higher in, in, in women? Well, uh, I think we can answer that when we look at the causes and um, mm. that makes sense. Uh, if you look uh, as a digression, if you look at the 
causes of uh, lymphedema in a large population. It's usually related to cancer, uh, breast cancer, pelvic cancer, um, which is female gender dependent. And so if you look, if you have edema caused by cancer, there's a bias towards the female sex. So that's why one, one would see this. And it's uh, cancer is one of the, in this population as we'll see, is the commonest cause of chronic edema. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I mean, uh, let's we'll see what the numbers are. Okay, so when they looked at the response rates for questionnaires for each service, the response rate was pretty good in community, nursing home, uh, specialist outpatient lymphedema, but you'll notice the number of patients that were identified, the highest number uh, was in the specialist outpatient lymphedema clinic. And this enters, if you're surveying a specialist clinic, you're biasing your sample uh, in favor of patients uh, with a lymphedema in particular and edema, as opposed to a community nursing service or uh, hospital inpatients. This table shows the underlying cause of chronic edema for patients attending the specialist outpatient lymphedema service. And this provides a clue to why the female gender uh, has a higher prevalence. The commonest cause, 38%, was secondary edema. And you'll notice what I call the lumping syndrome. They don't differentiate cancer versus infection versus inflammation, but I would suggest that the majority are caused by cancer and it is the higher, highest proportion of patients uh, with chronic edema. The next proportion, 26%, was what they called lymphovenous, again, sort of a lumpy, lumping syndrome where patients with obesity and reduced mobility are included. Primary lymphedema and venous disease have a lower prevalence, uh, which to me is pretty fascinating because this is contrary to the experience here in the United States. And they didn't break down the, the types of cancers, right? So presumably mm -hmm. most of them are breast and that's why it's affecting- Yeah, breast or pelvic. If you, as I said earlier, if you look at our recent paper where we uh, examined a large insurance population, about 30% of the cases were due to breast cancer, about 3.3% were due to pelvic cancers, and about 10% due to phlebolymphedema. The low recognition of phlebolymphedema or venous as a, as a cause is a reason that it's tremendously underestimated in the population, just as this survey shows. Steve, why do you think, you want to comment on the discrepancy with uh, your paper? Because your paper also, most of the- Well, his, pa his paper is a case series. That's different than an epidemiologic survey. So I'm saying, and that that's what we, there's very few epidemiologic surveys, and that's why I'm presenting this. What we rely on mostly are papers like Steve, which are the experience of an expert uh, lymphedema specialist, what he, he or she sees in their particular clinic. And the other thing that's different than Steve's uh, is that uh, you had a pretty low uh, prevalence or incidence of patients with cancer in your series. Is that correct, Steve? Uh, no, it was actually, it was 34%, and that was coming from a cancer center, so it was it was actually quite prevalent, but it was just less than the phlebolymphedemas. Uh, right. But, you know, still in this paper, Tom, I, to me, I still would lump all of this, whatever they're calling venous disease versus the uh, the lumped lymphovenous disease, and then you're about the same percentage as the other one. You come for the, it's about 35% when you put both those together, so they're all phlebolymphedemas, and then I just still, when you have that inflammation in there and I see inflammation, I don't think of cancer and inflammation. I, I just wonder how many of those have 
uh, flebolymphedema as well. Because well, this was a big population. I just, uh, just kind of. Well, you, what you've done is you've identified one of the flaws of this paper, uh, yeah. which I've criticized in uh, one of my previous writings due to the lumping syndrome. They never break out specific uh, etiologies of comorbidity as the cause of the chronic edema. Well, yeah. that and the, that the vast majority of the patients, two thirds of the patients, are from uh, a lymphedema center. Yes, um, it's a perfect example of bias, and bias leads to either the overestimation or underestimation of a disease trait. So these same investigators did a study in West London earlier, and smaller number, A23. But what you notice is the prevalence <clears throat> is higher in the Darby situation. And there's a particular difference between uh, the men and women in both places where the prevalence is much higher in Darby of women than it is in West London. So my first question is for the audience is, the major source, sources of patients for the Der, Derby, Derby study is general practice physicians, hospital inpatients, specialists, outpatient service, or community nursing. Please answer. Well, the correct answer, interesting enough, is specialist outpatient services. Remember the lymphedema clinic, which biases this epidemiologic survey. But it, again, it's one of the few around. Now, there's a contrast between the study under current discussion, the Derby, Derby City, and their previous study in Southwest London. In Southwest London, they had a higher prevalence of upper limb edema, which would suggest a, a gender difference too, predominantly female. And the lower limb edema was much higher in the Derby City versus the Southwest London. And the authors attribute this to the greater proportion of patients in the Darby City study with obesity. And just as uh, Steve Dean's study showed an incredible proportion of patients with elevated BMIs, uh, that too was found in the Darby study. And it's a growing problem for us in the United States treating uh, patients with lymphedema because it's such a high association uh, with an elevated BMI. So the conclusions was that the point prevalence of chronic edema in a heterogeneous health service population, which I would quibble with, is high and comparable to or greater than the prevalence of other serious long-term conditions such as stroke. And I think this is a very important point, how much of an impact on healthcare chronic edema has. And the previous study, the London study, the crude prevalence was about one third of the Darby study, and they attribute that to a higher degree of obesity. And when standardized the population of England, this difference was reduced slightly to three times that observed in London. And as I keep harping, obesity may be partially responsible for the higher prevalence because particularly the elderly obese who are older have reduced mobility and usually have a long-term condition. Again, as Tony pointed out, the prevalence of chronic edema is much higher among women than men, certainly twice as much. It's more prevalent among the obese and was highest amongst people over 85 years, 
probably related to the decreased mobility, although some of us in this age group still try and get out in the golf course. And finally, venous leg ulceration, they state many of these cases have concurrent chronic edema, which ranges from 25 to 50%. This association has received scant attention previously. My comment is not really, we're very well aware of that. Ergo, the comments by the two other speakers this evening on flebo lymphedema. So my final question is, the commonest cause of chronic edema in the Darby study was heart failure, secondary edema, which included cancer infection, obesity and reduced mobility, or venous disease. And this is just for this study, not from your general knowledge. Answers? Well, that's interesting. We really stress the obesity point so that <laughs> uh, people incorrectly answer that. Uh, it, it certainly may be in your experience, but in this particular study, it was secondary edema. And the final comment is we're still waiting for a good epidemiologic study uh, in lymphedema um, that is not handicapped by biases. A study as they've done in Edinburgh in venous disease and venous ulcers, where they survey a sample of the population and do physical exams and even duplex examinations. Uh, this, I think, suffers from lumping syndrome and the biases of concentrating on a lymphedema surface. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Very nice uh, presentation. And uh, we have a question from the audience, actually, uh, somebody you may know, Dr. Uh, Mark Iafredi. Jeez, and, I thought he was in uh, Nashville. Uh, well, I guess he's, uh, he's watching. Okay. So can you comment on the overall populations reported in the study? I wonder if we can assume that the study population represents the entire population with chronic edema. I wonder if there might be people at other medical facilities not studied in the zip code, or if there are people suffering silently at home and not receiving treatment. Thus, while this study demonstrates valuable comparison between groups, which is very helpful, do you think these numbers underrepresent the true prevalence? Well, of course, I always agree with my colleague, uh, Dr. Iafredi, but he brings up a very important point. Um, the sampling was not a general population. Uh, notice that they used general practice uh, patients. They used the lymphedema specialist. So Dr. Iafredi makes a very important point that the actual prevalence uh, is much higher uh, in the general population. So I totally agree with him. Okay. Steve, any other comments on, on the paper? Uh, no, with the exception of still, I still say that if you looked in there and they, they talked about the uh, the percentage of patients with cancer, it was actually low. It was three and five percent in the nursing home and community setting, respectively, I think it was. So to me, that means that that lump group still had some other diagnosis other than yeah. cancer. And so I still say when I see inflammation, it's CVI or flebo lymphedema until proven otherwise. And, and and the other thing is, even in the in the in the Darby group, majority was lower extremity, you know, so not breast cancer related upper extremity. So I'm still kind of puzzled with the double in, you know, prevalence in women. Well, that's, that's the problem. You can't get inside the data because yeah. of the way they've lumped it. Well, one thing's for sure, definitely yeah. the prevalence is significant and, and has an impact on... Well, it's comparable system. to stroke, which I yeah. think is a very important uh, health resource implication. All right. Thanks, Tom. Um, we're going to move along uh, to my uh, sidekick here, Steve Dean, who is going to talk about another UK study on the classification algorithm of primary lymphatic anomalies. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, yeah, you can see my, my topic here. Uh, of course, from a disclosure standpoint, huge surprise, tactile medical. 
And uh, I'd, let's start with our first question. Identify the gene mutation associated with Milroy's disease. Is it FOXC2, FLT4, SOX18, or GATA2? SOX18. I mean, I guess you're in charge of pulling up the answer. Oh, wow, 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 wow. Boy, I'm, I'm glad we're going through this. As you can see, the correct answer is actually FLT4 for Milroy disease. Glad a lot of you joined on tonight. Uh, which lymphedema syndrome is associated with myelodysplasia? Turner syndrome, yellow nail syndrome, Hennequin syndrome, or Emberger syndrome? Once again, I'm glad people have logged on. The correct answer is Emberger syndrome, and we'll, uh, we'll certainly discuss that uh, as we go through the algorithm. All right, so um, a couple of highlights here on the classification algorithm from the St. George's group on primary lymphatic anomalies. Uh, this is a contemporary algorithm to incorporate in your clinical practice to help you refine the diagnosis of primary lymphedema. It's a guide on genetic testing and management, and it provides a trans Form, transformational approach has revolutionized the understanding classification of primary lymphatic anomalies. And uh, let's just go through a little historical perspective here, dating all the way back to 1994, for instance, in my vascular medicine fellowship, uh, showing my age here. So uh, typical primary lymphedema is uh, classified by age of onset, rather simplistic classification, but uh, as I suspect everybody on here is aware, congenital lymphedema presents for age of one, uh, lymphedema precox presents uh, 1 to 35, but as you know, it's typically adolescence, uh, early 20s, and lymphedema tarda presents after the age of 35. So uh, the great irony here, of course, is this traditional simplistic classification scheme, I suspect most of you are still using it, uh, myself included, and a lot of patients. So in order to uh, circumvent this incredibly simplistic classification scheme, the St. George's group in London, England has produced an algorithm. Uh, and it was good that they were one of the first groups to recognize that primary lymphedema is not just one disease. It's certainly not just one disease that is only classified by age of onset. And also, for instance, not all primary lymphedema is Milroy disease. I can't tell you how many consults I get for Milroy disease, and it's not even remotely Milroy disease. They recognize there are highly variable phenotypes. They're one of the first groups to incorporate, incorporate widespread genotyping to identify these lymphatic mutations in the setting of primary lymphedema. And hence, the St. George's clinical algorithm was created in 2010 with update 2013 and 2020. We're going to discuss the latest iteration from 2020. And uh, here are the five categories of primary lymphedema under the St. George's classification group. Uh, we're going to go through examples of all these. Uh, first of all, would be syndromic, where lymphedema is not the primary problem. Second would be systemic or visceral lymphatic involvement with primary lymphedema, such as a pericardial infusion, pleural effusion, and intestinal problems like a protein losing enteropathy or ascites. Uh, congenital lymphedema, where lymphedema is the primary problem. Late onset lymphedema occurring after a, a year, again, typically occurring in adolescents, early 20s, where there is no systemic involvement, lymphedema is the primary problem. And finally, this group of lymphatic or vascular malformations. And you think, and I thought it was good there, there's a breakdown here of the percentages of these five categories. And it parallels what I suspect you see in your practice, which is late onset uh, lymphedema is by far the most common subtype that you're going to encounter. All right, so uh, again, as previously referenced, what's unique to this algorithm is actually incorporating genotyping to make a molecular diagnosis and setting of primary lymphedema when possible. And why is this important? Well, because it allows you to identify other at-risk problems of the primary lymphedema patients, such as varicose veins and hydrocele that complicate the Milroy disease patients, myelodysplasia or leukemia that complicates Emberger syndrome, the question I ask you, congenital heart disease, Noonan syndrome, Turner syndrome, learning difficulties, eye, renal, systemic abnormalities. We'll go through some of these. Uh, 
allows you to define the inheritance problem, the prognosis, the pathomechanism, for instance. For instance, FOXC2, is, which was one of the distractors, which is seen in the setting of lymphedema diastichiasis syndrome, is associated with diffuse lymphatic valvular reflux, neuroid disease. The lymphatics are present, they're just dysfunctional. And then finally, targeted therapy, which we will briefly discuss. So uh, obviously now, every patient that you see in your clinic should undergo a molecular diagnosis, correct? Uh, I wish it were that easy and wish it were true, but it's not. There are definitely problems about molecular, uh, molecular diagnosis. Number one would be that the detection rate is very low unless, unless you carefully phenotype these patients. And this is a remarkable number right here because even at the St. George's uh, Lymphedema Center of Excellence, even with careful phenotyping, they've only identified a causal gene in 25% of these primary lymphedema cases. For you, those of you that have ordered genetic testing in patients, you know it's not uncommon that you get back variants of uncertain significance. We get these genetic mutations that mean nothing and the patients are anxious about it and query about it and you can just simply say, I have no idea. So that's a problem. And then finally, a big problem is the lack of insurance reimbursement. Patients don't want to be stuck with a several thousand dollar bill for genetic testing. So here's our algorithm. This is a, a nice slide because it's all color coded. And let's go through these five categories, starting with the syndromic primary lymphedema, where lymphedema is not the dominant problem. A lot of unknown primary lymphedema syndromes out there. I see these and you, you know there's something unusual when you see a horseshoe kidney with lymphedema, but you don't know what syndrome is. And let's go through some of the known syndromes of primary lymphedema that I suspect a lot of you have seen. A prater willi syndrome, Turner syndrome, there's Noonan syndrome, tuber sclerosis, Hennequin syndrome, the hypotrichosis lymphedema telangiectasia syndrome with the well-known SOX18 mutation, Fabry disease, and yellow nail syndrome. And here's some examples of a couple of patients of mine that have syndromic lymphedema. There's a yellow nail syndrome uh, with the yellow nails and associated uh, bronchiectasis or pleural effusion. There's a case of Fabry's disease of mine uh, that had associated peripheral neuropathy and nephrotic syndrome. And all this is not my case, this is Mike Jaff's case, a uh, great case of Noonan syndrome. Um, and I wanna go through a couple of the, uh, the phenotypes of uh, Noonan syndrome. First of all, very unusually blue eyes, uh, hypertelorism, white space eyes, very low set ears that rotate backwards. Look at the bulbous nose of your Turner syndrome, an elongated philtrum, retronathia, webbing of the neck, and a pectus excavatum. Now that facial, uh, facial phenotype is not unique to Noonan syndrome. You will see that in a lot of different primary lymphedema cases. Uh, let's talk about, uh, on the pathway, the systemic and visceral involvement that can complicate primary lymphedema. What do we have here? Yellow nail syndrome and Noonan syndrome. So obviously there can be overlap between this category, the systemic visceral category and the syndromic category. And one thing that I must admit is good from this article that I've overlooked, it's important that you inquire if extra fluid was present in utero suggestive of fetal high drops where they have pleuropericardial infusions or ascites. That would lead you to uh, categorize this patient as likely having systemic primary lymphedema. Let's move on to congenital onset lymphedema. And by far the most common cause of congenital onset primary lymphedema is going to be Milroy disease. So that's where it is correct to use the term Milroy's disease. Um, and a couple of fun facts about Milroy's disease, as we can see here, the cause of mutation is FLT4, also known as VEGFR3. Although most cases are inherited, this can be sporadic. You should be aware that Milroy's disease is typically associated with varicose veins. And so if you go and ablate that refluxing saphenous vein, probably not going to make a lot of difference in the patient's leg swelling. And finally, hydrocele's, which complicate approximately one in three males with Milroy's disease. I definitely have seen that in my practice. And there's a case of mine that actually has Milroy's disease. Uh, this uh, patient and his brother were actually written up in a, in a very old article on Milroy's disease when it was first phenotyped. And then let's discuss the late onset group, which as we referenced previously is the most common subtype of primary lymphedema, typically presenting in adolescence. And there are three main subtypes that you should be aware of in this late onset group, because these are ones you're probably gonna see in your practice. First would be the lymphedema diastichiasis syndrome. Let's look at a couple of the relevant features. Can be associated with congenital heart disease, such as a tetralogy of flow. Once again, varicose veins, 100% 
of the lymphedema diastachiasis syndromes have some type of venous abnormality and typically refluxing great saphenous veins. You need to be aware of this. You're, if you think you're going to prove their edema by ablating their saphenous veins, probably not going to happen. Cleft pilot spinal cysts, and of course, the hallmark of lymphedema diastachiasis syndrome with the FOXC2 mutation is this extra row or aberrant row of eyelashes as seen here. FOXC2 mutation, lymphedema diastachiasis syndrome. The second syndrome you should be aware of is Meig-like or Meig syndrome. We're going to talk about it on the next slide. And we're also going to talk about the GATA2 associated late onset primary lymphedema. Meig's disease or Meig-like disease. This is the most common cause of primary lymphedema. This is your typical lymphedema precox. If there's a positive family history, you label them with Meig's disease. If there's no family history, it's Meig-like disease. These are females, onset puberty. And it's interesting, if you research Meig disease in the literature, there's clearly a paucity of information on this. And one thing that caught my eye is I would see that it's unilateral 70% of the time. And that goes against what I had seen in my practice. In fact, what I typically see when you follow these patients is they start off unilateral, but they ultimately involve the contralateral side with time. And I actually reached out to Dr. Mortimer, one of the authors here on the uh, uh, the publication here and ask him what his thoughts were on this. And he said, it's definitely a bilateral disease. It's asymmetrically bilateral. And even if it's unilateral, if you study these patients with lymphocentigraphy, there's usually a abnormality in the contralateral unaffected limb. And important that you recognize that genetic testing is typically negative. So you're wasting your time if you try to find, identify a gene mutation in this population in the absence of any other syndromic features. And the third most common, as you recall, as I talked about the primary lymphedema with the GATA2 mutation, this is Imberger syndrome. And these are two of patients in my practice that have Imberger syndrome. Uh, one of them has already had acute myelogenous leukemia and the other in his 50s has myelodysplasia, uh, sometimes associated with deafness. And you'll also see these patients uh, are predisposed to widespread warts. Neither of my patients have widespread warts, but Imberger syndrome is that third most common uh, primary late onset lymphedema that you should be aware of. And this is where it's important to get this mutation so you can identify that these patients are at risk for potentially fatal blood disease. One thing I liked about this article is they made the following comment because I see this overlooked in the lymphedema population that care must be taken to inquire about and examine for hand or upper extremity lymphedema as it can easily be missed only by asking for swelling on the back of the hand and not just the fingers will upper extremity lymphedema be detected. And uh, it, it's you know, obviously when people see you, they're concerned about their leg swelling and they never even realize that their hands and fingers are often mildly swollen. Now you may ask yourself, why are the lymphedema diastachiasis syndrome and Imberger syndrome not classified under syndromic lymphedema? Well, that's because lymphedema is the dominant feature in both of these disorders. And then finally, we have the vascular malformation subtype, uh, the classic example being clippotrinidase syndrome with the associated PIK3CA mutation. And the second most commonly, parks rubber syndrome with the RASO1 mutation. And then finally, you have lymphatic malformations, uh, specifically a generalized lymphatic anomaly or diffuse lymphatic anomaly. And here's some vascular malformations with PIK3CA from my practice. Here's a cerebral martyrell. They don't know the genetic uh, subtype of cerebral martyrell. Uh, great pictures to look at though. And then finally, a lymphatic malformation of patient mice with a generalized lymphatic anomaly. And you look at this and go, wow, that just looks like typical lymphedema. What's generalized about that? Well, how often have you seen abdominal pelvic and genital involvement that looks like this? and also involving the breast. That's a remarkable case to say the least. So in conclusion, uh, the St. George's classification algorithm of primary lymphatic anomalies has clearly revolutionized the understanding and classification of primary lymphatic anomalies via genotyping uh, when appropriate and phenotyping. And it facilitates insight into disease and including associated complications. I mean, again, that classic example of Imberger's syndrome being associated with potentially fatal myelodysplasia that you'd like to know about. It gives you the opportunity for targeting new therapies, for instance, using uh, mTOR inhibitors for uh, PIK3CA mutation associated vascular malformation such as clipotrinity syndrome. And this is a dynamic algorithm as I showed you previously, it's already been updated three times as more syndromes and more uh, causative genotypes have been uh, identified. So I will stop there and uh, any, any questions at all?
Very nicely, Steve. Um, great paper. Uh, yeah, it's an incredible paper. Time. I was, I'm just so excited when I get this paper and talk about it. Uh, the I guess, you know, as you can see from that algorithm, pretty extensive diagnostic, uh, you know, pretty extensive differential. Um, I guess for the typical venous or lymphatic specialist um, or any uh, anybody else that's in the audience that doesn't really have a strong focus on, on all these different types of lymphedema, how, how do you use this in a clinical practice and, and how does it change your management of these patients? Well, I think I've, I've given you one example there, for instance, with the, with the Imberger syndrome, yeah. you really would want to identify that GATA T mutation for, for obvious reasons. But also when you, when you have an awareness of all these other potential complications, it just, it opens up, uh, I mean, let's just take, for instance, um, uh, the hydrocele to complicate Milroy's disease. If you're seeing these patients early in life, you have to tell them to be aware if it's a male that you very well could have hydrocele's down the road. I mean, the, the possibilities are endless here as far as I think about the associated complications with the Turner syndrome. I mean, you want to get an echo on them uh, to look for a bicuspid aortic valve or coarctation of the aorta. If it was a Noonan syndrome, I would look for pulmonic stenosis. So you would go be above and beyond diagnostically what would you do you, what you would do for a typical primary lymphedema case. I mean, why would you get an echo on a typical primary lymphedema case? Whereas if you had identified it was a Noonan's or a Turner, which often gets under uh, diagnosed at least early on. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, to me, those are just a couple examples. And give me some time, I can come up with some more for you. No, it's just that I mean, I'm kind of uh, puzzled because I'll tell you. I mean, I maybe I don't see all these different types of lymphedema in my practice, but I, on the flip side of, it, I don't really focus on them. I mean, I just focus on their lymphedema. Any, any difference in how you're going to manage the lymphedema part in these different types of patients? I don't think there's any difference necessarily in the lymphedema part, with the exception of you come across the rare subtypes that have lymphangiectasias like a Hennequin syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, then those are people that you could potentially refer to a radiologist that can actually go in and ablate some of the uh, intestinal uh, lymphatics that are involved in their protein losing enteropathy, for instance. Uh, uh, let me think what else. But as far as let's just say leg edema, it's probably not going to change your management. So, so the typical thing with compression, uh, flexi touch, or intermittent. Yeah, and, and then and then I would D. exactly, and I would emphasize or underscore the point of uh, there's an overlap in Milroy's and and uh, lymphedema diastasis with venous disease, and I've seen this happen. They have undergone great saphenous vein ablation. It's actually made their lymphedema worse. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're not going to make their lymphedema better. So you should be aware of that the two diseases can coexist. It's just I think the other Steve, the other important point is the growing appreciation of bilaterality of the disease, even though it's not clinically evident. Actually, when I was back with Professor Kinmouth, we were doing good old-fashioned lymphangiography in these patients with primary lymphedema. And you'd see, as you just said, one side that clearly has lymphedema, but the contralateral leg doesn't have the evidence, but has the absence, uh, the absence of lymphatic trunks just as the affected leg does. So you got to be able to treat both legs in this situation. Exactly. So they have inherent, inherent cellulitis risk in that a setting of occult lymphedema on the contralateral limb. So you should be aware of that. And I think it really was interesting on this MIGS disease. You look up like, what is MIGS disease? I always see that I never got a good answer. And there is no good answer. But re regardless of what you read in the literature, it's not just typically unilateral. I mean, it's, it's bilateral. Well, it, generally in the adolescent female, it affects the left leg so much Absolutely. That, that they used to think it was due to the uh, compression yep. of, the, of the venous system, not Tom, the lymphatics. Tom, when you were seeing patients, how often did you actually pay attention to figure out what type of underlying lymphedema? Primary versus secondary? No, the different, you know, this... Uh, Algorithm that Steve talks about. Uh, this is real, really new. I mean, being aware of the genetics, certainly within the last five years. And, and Steve, how often do when do you when would you get any genetic testing? Uh, if I see somebody that has a characteristic phenotype that I'm worried about, uh, I would, and especially the uh, 
it's the lymphedema diastachysis syndrome is probably a lot more prevalent than you realize. And if you do a good examination on them, I mean, I'm going right for the eyelashes and it's, it's mm-hmm. amazing. And then also you even have a clue beforehand. You ask them, do your eyelashes bother you? And they say, Oh yeah, I have to pluck my eyelashes because they irritate my eyes. And that's your diagnosis right there. So, and it's good to know you know, from a, a genetic standpoint too, what the, what's the risk of uh, you uh, become pregnant and what's the chances of your offspring developing uh, the disease. So, All right. So I'm going to move ahead with uh, the last uh, paper for tonight. And um, I want to thank Tom for really starting this uh, journal club. I think this is what our fifth or sixth one. Um, Cause it really, you know, gives us an opportunity to the review of the literature and, and papers like uh, the one that uh, Steve just uh, presented, which really has an impact on, on clinical practice. Uh, so another interesting paper um, that I think uh, that I picked was uh, this one here, which looks at patient reported outcomes following intervention for superficial venous disease in patients who uh, presented with uh, C3 disease or leg swelling. So these are my uh, disclosures. And when you look at the, the differential uh, diagnosis for a swollen leg, it's pretty extensive. And it could either be unilateral, or bilateral, and obviously acute or chronic. And depending on, on the clinical scenario, your diagnosis, differential diagnosis, uh, can be fine tuned. Now, this is uh, an algorithm we published last year in Phlebology uh, for patients with chronic leg edema. And you can see here, evaluating for systemic causes, and then uh, getting down into a diagnostic algorithm, looking for venous and lymphatic disease. And patients with combined venous and lymphatic pathology, uh, we, we lump some into this flebal lymphedema. And how do you, uh, the next question is, how do, you, how do you treat these patients and what do you address and, and what are the outcomes after intervention? So we're working on this treatment pathway. Uh, and obviously in patients who have underlying venous disease and have signs and symptoms, um, we would get an ultrasound, evaluate where the pathology is, and then manage their underlying uh, venous pathology. And that includes conservative therapy following by interventions for any superficial disease um, or treatment of an, any underlying, underlying uh, deep venous disease. So the question is what happens to these patients after intervention and the data in the literature is, is really sparse. And this paper makes an attempt to, to report on patient reported outcomes after intervention for superficial venous ablation. Now, as I mentioned, there are multiple potential etiologies for leg swelling and often these conditions may be coexisting with underlying venous disease, therefore making it very difficult to differentiate or evaluate the impact of each one on the patient's edema. So the paper hypothesized that patients with C3 disease um, would benefit with ablation, uh, but that there's a certain subgroup of patients that would not uh, uh, benefit as much. So my question to like Tom and and Steve, what patients do you think in your practice who have C3 disease have other underlying edema producing conditions that you've noticed? Uh, oh my gosh, I'd say, oh, I don't know, 30%, 40%. Um, I see so much in the way of heart. I'm on a, card, I'm a, I'm a cardiology yeah. group, so I see a lot of heart failure. So, yeah, so I mean, I and guess the medications, oh my gosh, the medication, yeah. No, it's, I think I agree with in my practice too, it's pretty high. And obviously, patient expectations is very important when you're treating these patients, in that if there are under, underlying causes on top of their venous disease. They may not improve at all, or they may improve somewhat. Well, so really you haven't really- commented on the what is the status of the lymphatics in these patients with C3 disease. What do you what think? That? What is the status of the lymphatics in patients with C3 venous disease? Yeah, good question. I mean, uh, obviously, that's another uh, unknown answer. Um, that really, and 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 as well, far as what is is it is it lymphatic disease that is reversible or not after you treat their venous disease. Well, well, they, these patients do have lymphatic abnormalities as the recent paper from Eva Sevick's group showed that in even early venous disease, you see early changes in the lymphatic system. Correct. Um, so, so like I said, um, the, 
this paper is, was looking at patients between 2005 and 15, um, only with C3 disease who had saphenous reflux. And they did a venous segmental disease score calculation, which is based off of the ultrasound findings. Um, they get different points depending on what vein segments are involved and they get a score. The higher the score, the, high, the more reflux is present um, or obstruction. They uh, were all treated with conservative therapy using elastic compression prior to intervention. Uh, they, they also collected any edema producing conditions that the patient may have had. And then uh, if they had failed conservative therapy, they went ahead to be treated with either ablation or ablation and phlebectomies uh, with use of elastic compression for one week. So the patient reported outcomes was based off of a survey that was created. And the questions included, as you can see in the table here, those seven questions, um, looking at the amount of edema, both prior to intervention, after intervention, and then at follow-up uh, that was done. Uh, they also collected data on use of compression stockings and satisfaction of the procedure. And uh, one of the flaws of these studies, obviously, is that they, they were contacted on follow-up with either email or phone call. Uh, and a lot of these questions, would, these questions were based on recollection of their memory from you know, um, anywhere from a few months to a few years prior there, uh, when they had their intervention. Now, as, as far as the amount of edema, uh, they used a variation of the VCSS score. They used the uh, segment of the VCSS score that measures edema with zero being none, one mild limited to the foot and ankle, moderate extending above the ankle, but below the knee and severe extending above um, the knee. So, hey, Tony, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. That, that caught my eye about the above knee swelling or thigh swelling, yep. and, and yet this was addressing great saphenous ablation. How do you think the great saphenous ablation helps thigh swelling? I, was... I, I, I don't think it does. Yeah. And obviously, this is where other causes of edema are you know, involved in that, in that, okay. in their swelling. Sorry. Um, and obviously, VCSS is used for anybody with chronic venous disease, which may include, you know, proximal obstruction eventually. Um, but these patients were, again, were isolated to um, saphenous reflux. So 1,600 or so limbs um, had been treated during that time period. A little bit over 500 of them uh, had C3 disease uh, based off the medical records. And you can see the follow-up there. There was 92 patients out of those 528 that, or sorry, 128 limbs out of the 528 limbs who um, represented 92 patients that responded to the uh, survey. And you can see here the demographics. Of note, the, their segmental disease score was around 2.7. Um, interestingly, about 50% of the patients um, had microphlebectomy at the same time. Um, and you can see 15% um, of the patients had diuretic use. Um, as far as other demographics, pretty typical. Um, for the uh, disease process. Um, edema producing conditions in those 92 patients was present in 27 of them. Um, so about uh, a quarter of the patients had other reported conditions that would be causing edema uh, potentially. Now, as far as outcomes after intervention, um, you can see here 73% had no uh, much swelling after their procedure. And that 60% uh, of them had not much swelling. So about 40% of the patients uh, had persistent swelling or residual swelling after intervention on follow-up. Um, and in those patients with associated edema producing conditions, 23 out of 27 had improvement after ablation, which tells you that even if they have underlying other causes of edema, that treatment of their superficial disease um, can improve their edema. But again, patient expectation, I think, is, is very important in these patients. As far as how effective producing uh, the procedure had in eliminating your swelling, you can see 65% felt it was very effective. Um, when it came to use of compression stocking, this was kind of surprising. So 1,400 days of follow-up, you had 70 almost percent, 64% of the, 65% of the patients we're still using compression stockings uh, at follow-up. And when they did, um, over 70% of them had moderate amount or a lot 
as far as uh, how much they, uh, they, they, they saw as far as how much help the stockings had in their swelling. So when they did a multivariant analysis looking at age, gender, BMI, and other stuff, uh, as you can see there, they saw that age, gender, BMI, and duplex findings had no impact on the ablation results, which is a little interesting to me. I thought that in my experience, BMI really um, has an effect, but uh, um, that was interesting. None of the uh, uh, edema producing uh, conditions negatively impacted results. And when you look at segmental disease score and duplex ultrasound, uh, if they saw an association between the increased severity of disease with their pre-op edema, which is not too surprising. This was a little bit interesting. So phlebectomies not only was a predictive factor for edema resolution, it also predicted high patient satisfaction. Um, so obviously the more you manage the superficial disease and not only treat the saphenous vein, but also their, their, their varicose veins, they had a better improvement overall in their uh, resolution of their edema. So some of the limitations, which are pretty obvious of this study is, uh, you know, they only had about a quarter response rate, uh, which may lead to bias. This was a retrospective data collection. And not only that, but uh, evaluation of the edema was subjective with really over the phone recollection of the patient as far as how much edema they had before versus uh, currently. Uh, there was no quality of data, life data. Uh, the survey was based off of a category of the VCSS as far as evaluation of the severity of the edema. And uh, like I said, it was based off of patient recall. Obviously, there's an error factor there. Um, when it came to the uh, edema-producing uh, conditions, a small subgroup of the, of the total group, a quarter of them, but again, interestingly, did not affect um, outcomes after uh, as far as uh, improvement of edema. So kind of in summary, patient report outcomes uh, for venous ablation for edema secondary to superficial disease seems to be a pretty effective with a high patient satisfaction. Phlebectomies improves overall edema response rate. Um, the higher the venous segmental disease score or the severity of reflux or obstruction, in this case, just reflux, uh, was a very predictive uh, indication of the preoperative edema in the response, but did not have a DMR response or patient satisfaction uh, correlation. BMI, gender, and, and, and age did not predict a DMR response. And interestingly, or not surprisingly, uh, because I see this also in my practice, persistent swelling was present in 40% of the patients, and moderate severe was present in a third of the patients. Um, high percentage of patients used compression in this group, and when they did, they, they saw moderate to a lot of improvement in their edema. So really, what to do to these patients um, when they, you do treat their underlying venous disease and they have persistent swelling, you manage, obviously, their, their edema. And that includes evaluation of the patient for access to care, adherence to therapy, and to see if there are any lymphatic surgery potential. Um, as far as uh, access to care, uh, referring them to a, a, a therapist if, if that's possible and, and available to them. Uh, but obviously, this is a short-term uh, option for them because of insurance coverage. And there needs to be a home phase therapy, which includes uh, patient education, uh, exercise, weight loss, you know, compression, uh, in the IPC, MLD, uh, in order to provide a comprehensive management of their edema. So... Treat their superficial oral obstruction. If the symptoms resolve, great in patients with C3 disease. If they have persistent disease, treat their lymphatics. And with that, I will stop sharing and open for discussion. Tom, uh, you're muted. Sorry, sorry. I got it. I got it. The, the BMI issue, again, yeah, that caught my eye right away, but until I looked in the, the mean BMI was 30. So it wasn't 29. Exactly a yeah, a little population. bit over 29 point something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, what, so not, not a typical. Exactly. <laughs> not an Ohio population, I can tell you <laughs> no. that. I'm no. I, I must say that the percentage of patients with persistent edema is very impressive and harkens back to one of the famous vascular surgeons in the United States, one of the early ones, uh, Robert Linton, who 
late in his practice, I had a chance to work with, and he said, never promise anybody on whom you're doing varicose vein surgery that has edema that you'll get rid of it. And it goes back to your, as you said, patient expectations, because he, from his clinical experience, obviously noticed that a number of patients persisted. One of the questions I was going to ask is, did they comment on the status of the deep system in these patients? Yeah, so yeah. you can see, oops. Hello? Echo? You want to just mute? You want? So, so as far as the lymphatic, the deep system, um, they didn't really say they excluded, but I think most of the patients had no deep venous disease. Only 1.2% of the patient had a history of DVT. Um, so I don't think they included, it was pretty clean as far as isolated superficial reflux. Also, as far as you'd like to know what percentage of those patients persistent even were still on a medication associated with swelling, because that was the most common cause of, of a secondary cause they list with the medication. So if they didn't stop the medication, you wouldn't expect the swelling mess to get that much better. Correct. Uh, they didn't really comment on that. Again, yeah, this, but that was, it's obviously a, a recollection paper, and uh, which I think is the biggest limitation. But again, it, data definitely that we would need to see what, um, I mean, in my clinical practice, this is really relevant. And there are some papers looking at deep venous intervention that show that patients do have persistent swelling after intervention. And that could be either because of misdiagnosis as far as what the predominant cause of their swelling is, or longstanding disease affecting the lymphatic system to the point where the lymphatic pathology is not reversible, or a combination of the two. Good point. Hey, uh, there's a question here for or Tommy, the interventionist here. Somebody asked, what do you think of anterior accessory great saphenous vein disease causing thigh swelling along with varicosities? I said, I'd defer to you on that. Yeah, typically it doesn't cause, I mean, you may see bulging veins in the thigh, but anterior accessory saphenous typically does not cause Possibly. thigh swelling okay. um, or edema. Um, extension of edema up into the thigh um, is usually, you know, proximal obstruction if it's a venous cause. There was a question about uh, lymphatic surgery um, from uh, Dr. Stanbro. Steve, are you responding to that? Yeah, I respond to it. Oh my gosh, got feedback. Uh, uh, believe it or not, our plastic surgeon has been doing, uh, has done a couple of lymphovenous bypasses on these primary lymphedema patients. I, I haven't seen any improvement yet, but what I have seen improvement with is liposuction. I mean, that's uh, that's what's improved the, the primary lymphedema patient. Yeah, I mean, you think the lymphovenous bypass being predominantly for secondary lymphedema, which it is, but there are a couple of for primary. case series out there on using it, especially in France, I think it is, of using it for a primary lymphedema or even vascular lymph node transplant, but I, that's not commonplace. By any it, it, it doesn't make sense from an anatomic point of view because yeah. uh, the majority of patients with primary lymphedema have hypoplasia in their lymphatic vessels, so there's no network which is drawing the lymph lymphatic fluid in to anastomose to the venous. Yeah. It's, 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 as you said, it, it's usually used for patients with secondary lymphedema who have uh, obstruction. Yeah. Um, All right. I think uh, any other comments or closing remarks? There's one more question here about expanding on liposuction for lymphedema. And it, it just, the, the issue is that, especially in somebody that has end stage lymphedema, 70 to 80% of that lymph volume is fat. So the only way you're getting rid of that is with liposuction. And it's, it's an effective procedure if it's done correctly. And if you can get insurance to pay for it, which is the rate limiting factor at our Yeah, but it's not a cure. You're no, wedded to uh, com 
usually to some form of mechanical compression for the rest of your life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Not even remotely a cure, but the patients are certainly happy as a whole. Very, very happy yeah, to have some people. It's a modern day version of the debulking operations we used to do yeah. a long time ago. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, wrap it up. I think uh, three great papers um, and very valuable papers for, for clinical practice. And uh, I'd like to invite everybody to a couple of uh, upcoming events that Tactile is running. Uh, one's going to be um, in June 2nd on lipedema and understanding it for vascular specialists. And then uh, June 9th, recognizing primary lymphedema and the differential diagnosis uh, continuing education course, uh, which again is uh, Wednesday, June 9th. Um, I'd like to thank Tactile for putting this great program and, and really supporting uh, education 